Hi, I'm Liz Nedden. Let's have a look at sources of variation, particularly when we're talking about secondary data. So secondary data is data that someone else has collected. So we only have some metadata information about the information, the data, and we've got to look into how the data was collected. So here's just a few of the slides to remind us about what we're looking for in data. So one of the things that we look for is whether the data or the sample is that representative of the population. Was a random method used? Was a bias method used? We want to look at the measurements. Were the measurements accurate? So we want to look for information about how the data was collected. Then we need to think about what were the instructions given? what things were controlled, what conditions were kept the same. So there's often times we're going to be able to access that information and find out how the process was um, carried out. If we aren't able to find out how the process was carried out, then we need to still make some comments and identify some possible sources of variation and look at how they could have been managed. So let's have a look at the different sources of variation again to remind us. So we've got our natural or real variation. So this is just the natural differences between the people or the objects that we are um, exploring. We've got occasion to occasion measurements. So when we repeat measurements on the same person or object, we can get different uh, um, results. So measuring your blood pressure at different times of the day, you'll get slightly different measurements every time you do it. We've got measurement variation, so that's looking at how accurate your measurements are. So that's why we want to look closely at those details of how, what instructions were given to people, what equipment did they use. Then we've also got induced variations. So these are variations that, other than your natural variation, can lead to differences. So for example, if we're looking at um, how plants grow, then we know that different amounts of sunshine, if they get more sunshine, then they're likely to grow taller. If they get less water, they're not likely to grow as much. Um, more nutritious soil. So what we want to be able to do is identify these other factors that are likely to affect the variation in the data. And the last one is sampling variation. So this is looking at when we take another sample, how likely are we to get similar or quite different statistics? And so this comes back to the method used. And we know there's always going to be some sample to sample variation. So from these five different categories in the assessment, you need to cover at least two of these categories. Some of them are going to be much easier to deal with and some of them are going to be more difficult at this level. So here are some questions that when you get some metadata or a data set, these are some of the things that you want to think about and these will help us identify these sources of variation. So here's an incorrect example. As if I, this is a tr what we call a trivial example, it's not deep enough, it's not um, giving us enough information to meet the criteria for the standard. So if I want to look at the length of a pen, then I need to think about using centimetres. And I always need to use centimetres and not sometimes use the ruler with centimetres and sometimes use the ruler with inches. So that's identifying a source of variation and that I always need to use centimetres, but it's not sufficient for NCA level one. Let's have a look at our Kiwi data set. So this is some of the metadata about the Kiwi data set and I'm just focusing on two particular variables that I might be doing an investigation on. So I'm looking at the gender and the weight of the Kiwi bird. So let's now go through each of the different sources of variation and identify um, and explain some sources of variation. So we need to identify, explain them and we need to talk about how we could manage them and what the effect might be. So if I think about the gender and the weight, those for every kiwi bird, that's naturally going to vary between every single kiwi bird there. Their gender and their weight is going to vary. And in this case, it's actually not possible to control or limit 
the natural variation between each bird. Um, so that's why this example here won't meet the criteria for the standard because this idea of natural variation is always going to be present. But now if I look at the occasion to occasion variation, so this is looking at repeated measurements on the same person, or in this case, the same measurements on the same, um, repeated measurements on the same kiwi bird. So if I measured the kiwi bird, their height or weight at different times of the day, we might get some different answers. So, oh, this is measuring the heights, I should say measuring the weights. So measuring the weights of the kiwi birds at different times of the day could give us slightly different results. The same as for humans. If I stand on the scales in the morning versus in the um, late afternoon, there will be differences in my weights. And it's the same for kiwis. So what I'm suggesting is that their weight is likely to be slightly lower in the early evening because they've been resting all day their body's been digesting food, their body's been using energy um, for the organs and everything else as they were sleeping. So whereas if they were doing it during the morning, shortly after they've spent all night foraging, they might have a slightly higher weight. So that's me identifying the source of variation. It's talking about the effect of that source of variation. And then the last bit at the bottom is I'm talking about managing it. So to manage that variation, my suggestion is that the kiwis should all be measured in the morning before lunch and this will give us more consistent measurements. Now I don't know for sure if this was exactly what was done when the data was collected because I couldn't find out more information about the specifics of that but this is me making a good suggestion about a recommendation if I had been collecting the data. So now let's have a look at measurement variation. So that's talking about the measurements itself and what are the variations that we can find. So there's a video that I've found that shows the process of weighing the bird. And what essentially happens is I've got the little spring scale on the right hand side there. As they put the kiwi bird into a bag, attach that to the hook at the bottom and then hold that hook up in the air and the, the weight then comes up on the scale. But if you can imagine a kiwi bird in a bag, the kiwis are likely to be moving around. Um, they're wild creatures, they're animals, they're, that's their natural response. So what I do know is that because that kiwi bird is moving around, the weight's going to be a good estimate. It's not terrible, but it's not going to be as accurate as I might like. So in order to manage that, my recommendation is that we have the same person and the same equipment being used to measure the weight of every kiwi bird. Because then the methodology that they use um, and the equipment that they use is all the same. So another example of measurement variation is looking into how do you actually identify the sex, because that was one of the um, variables was the gender or sex of the kiwi bird. So there's currently two methods that they use. One method is where they measure the length of the bill or beak um, of an adult kiwi. So it does, doesn't work for, this method doesn't work for younger kiwis. And then they have a reference length. And if it's more than that, it's classified as female. If it's shorter than that, it's classified as male. So you can imagine most of the time it will give us the right answer in terms of what sex it actually is, but there'll be times when it won't. The other method that can be used is by extracting DNA from a feather. And so that correctly identifies the sex in 95% of the samples. And this is information I found doing a little bit of research. So again, even with extracting DNA, we're not getting every single kiwi bird identified correctly. And I think one of the things that they, I read somewhere that they were doing is they'll often um, take several feathers from the kiwi bird so that they can use that to determine the sex of several feathers and therefore get a more accurate estimate. So my last step is to identify which one of what I suggest and manage that variation. And my suggestion is that um, I would hope that they were doing DNA testing because that's probably more accurate than just comparing to um, a particular length.
because we don't know how old the kiwi birds are when we collect them and measure them so it sometimes could be quite hard to tell if it's a juvenile or if it's an adult. So another type of variation is our induced variation. So this is looking at what else might affect the um, weights or the genders. So if I look at what happens during different seasons of the year. Well, from the research that I found, um, just a quick little bit of Google, was I looked and they found that the breeding season is between June to March, and that's often when the food is most plentiful. So often that's the time of year where the ground is reasonably moist, so there's a lot of bugs and beetles and um, insects for the kiwi birds to eat. So during that time, I would expect that they would weigh a little bit more during that season because there's more food available. So that breeding season is going to affect um, the weight of the kiwis. And to manage that variation, I recommend that we keep measure them during the same month of the year. So our weights are all going to be much more consistent um, rather than if I measure some out of the breeding season and some in the breeding season that would give me more variation in the data. A second example is looking well what happens if a female is carrying an egg and so if they're carrying an egg particularly for kiwis which have um, very very large weights compared to their body size I would expect that their weight is likely to be higher during that time. So I know that so therefore being pregnant would affect the weight of that kiwi bird. So we want to try and manage that variation and I would recommend avoiding collecting measurements during that breeding season. And there'd be lots of other good biology reasons why not to disturb a female that might be pregnant as well. You know, you want to be respectful and careful um, and, and don't want to upset the kiwi too much by a stranger reaching in their burrow, taking them out and weighing them. So that would be a good recommendation to try and get more consistent and accurate measurements. Of course there's lots of other factors that can affect it. So for example the location. There might be some areas where there's a lot more food in some areas. Um, it could be that the mountain air, it could be that all sorts of different things that could affect it. So the location is likely to have an effect. The number of predators. So if it's in a predator controlled area where they actively um, have kept out the pests then I would expect the weights to be a little bit more. So those are some of the things that might otherwise might affect the weight of the kiwi. The last variation is our sampling variation. So we want to think about what happens if we were to take another sample. And so I need to think about, well, is the data in the data set, is that a representative sample? Is it a biased sample? Is it a random sample? What do we think is going on there? And so we want to know whether the data is likely to represent those. And our summary statistics are likely to be similar if we took a similar type of sample. But that variation, again, we can't really control that variation. That's just naturally present by taking a sample. The only way to eliminate this is by collecting data from the entire population. And that's not likely to be possible for all kiwi birds because we don't know where every single kiwi bird is. The only thing that we can help a little with this is taking a slightly larger sample size will improve that amount of variation. But that's our only other possibility. So my recommendation when it comes to writing up this for your assessment is that you particularly focus on the induced variation, the measurement variation and the occasion to occasion variation. Those are the ones that you're most likely to be able to discuss and explore in more detail. Thanks for watching.